a fish processing facility. Every day, 500 tons of seasonal raw materials are transformed here into 400 tons of frozen food and 450,000 cans of canned food. Nothing unusual, it seems, for a land-based enterprise. But this factory is located on board of a huge ship which plies hundreds of miles away from the nearest shore and thousands of miles from the home port. And its full name is Floating Fish Cannery Vsevelod Sibirtsev. For nine long months, it becomes not only a workplace for 435 crew members, but also their home on the sea. In summer, they catch salmon and salary in the southern part of the Sea of Okhotsk. In autumn, they go to the north. There are shoals of Pacific herring. We've squeezed several weeks into several dozen of minutes to show what it means to depend on the sea, to be devoted to it, and what it means to live on the sea. the north of the Sea of Okhotsk. On fishing maps, this place is marked as the fishing area 51. The floating base Vsevelod Sibirtsev has been operating here for almost a month, along with several trawler saners. The scheme is simple. Trawlers catch fish, which is then transferred to the floating base, where it is immediately processed. Reefer ships take the finished products away and bring food as well as containers for canned fish for the crew of Vsevelod Sibirtsev. That is, they are responsible for the communication between the factory and the shore. The main advantage of the floating base is that the production is as close as possible to fresh, untreated, so-called all natural fish products. It takes five to six days for fishing vessels to sail from the fishing area to the developed infrastructure. During this time, all fish products that were caught can deteriorate. For this, there are processing bases, in particular, Vsevelod Sibirtsev. The floating base Vsevelod Sibirtsev is difficult to compare with anything that moves. For example, it is two and a half times longer than the Airbus 380, the largest passenger aircraft in the world, and seven meters longer than the submarine of the Project 941, the famous Shark, the largest nuclear submarine cruiser on the planet. This may seem implausible, but Vsevelod Sibirtsev is only a couple of dozen meters shorter than the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. From the bow, which is crowned by the bridge, to the stern, beneath which there is the engine room, the distance is around 100 meters. This is the distance the inhabitants of the bow need to cover to get to the gym, dining room, ward room, in general, all that we're used to calling amenities. Every detail of the floating base structure is well thought out. In the bow and the stern superstructures, there are the crew's living quarters. Moreover, cabins can be compared to cozy hotel rooms. In addition to the gym, there is a cinema, saunas, a swimming pool, and a hospital. On the first, second, and third decks, there is the working area, which is equipped with a real fish processing plant with conveyors for fish processing. And beneath it, there are four holds, each with three vertical rooms for the storage of finished products. 
The bridge is equipped with the most modern equipment, where all the parameters of the floating base are displayed, from speed to fuel reserves. The latest navigation equipment is also installed here. The most important man on Sibirtsev, as well as on any ship, is the captain. Only here, one more post is added to this one. It is the director with the corresponding extension of the responsibilities. It is such a complicated, complicated process. Pretty thorough, scrutinous, that's it. And here is the production manager, chief masters, masters. And in the course of work, we have briefings, short meetings. Because this is production, that's the difference between the captain director and the captain. As a matter of fact, Valery Voloshin controls not only his own floating base. He, as an admiral in the Navy, must coordinate all the actions of the expedition members, captains of trawlers and carriers, and of course, report to the authorities on the ground. According to the project, Sivalud Sibirsev has a high autonomy of navigation, 80 days, but in fact, it can be at sea for much longer. We may not take fuel for three to four months, you know? Well, just the same. We have food for half a year. There is enough, well, in the storerooms. Sevelod Sibirtsev's fate has been hard. A couple of years ago, the owner nearly scrapped it. It seemed that even renovation at Chinese shipyards and significant investments in modernization could not ensure the normal functioning of such a ship in the 21st century. Russian entrepreneurs held a different point of view and weren't afraid to return the huge floating base to Russia. This is the only possible economic method, in my opinion, in my mind, for maintaining deep processing of Far Eastern fish products. Sevelod Sibirtsev was built a quarter of a century ago in Finland, specifically for Far Eastern fishermen. The factory ship became one of the three vessels of this type. For Finland, the construction of such an object for the Soviet Union, even at that time, was an important event. So this issue was approached thoroughly and seriously. The Finnish shipbuilders used the most modern equipment of the time. They tried to make the ship as convenient and practical as possible. Special attention was paid to security. It's built in such a way that, for example, if any two adjacent compartments are flooded, it remains afloat. That's it. Well, you can imagine, yeah, what it is. In other words, it is quite safe in that respect, and there are usually no fears. In the Soviet era, the factory ship was recognized many times as the best in the Far East. Then the big country was gone. Hard times came. A few years later, on the ground of unprofitability, Sevelod Sibirtsev was sold for a song to Greece, nominally, but in fact, to China. In China, they wanted to make a fishing hotel out of the floating base. But then the Chinese scrapped the project. Its new owner, a fishing company Dobro Float, began to prepare the vessel for its return home. We started modernizing the plant. In other words, the plant was rebuilt. Since there weren't any conveyors, any freezers, there was nothing. We had to repair everything. The equipment was repaired in the engine room and on the working decks. In the plant, departments processing lines were restored and conveyors were fixed. And Pseva Lod Sibirtsev again resumed its duties. While Vsevelod Sibirtsev is operating in the so-called Area 51 of the Sea of Okhotsk, Garmonia, one of those reefer ships which run between the floating base and the coast, is being loaded in the port of Nakhotka. Soon it will go to sea to deliver provisions to Vsevelod Sibirtsev and pick up the finished products, frozen fish and canned food. The floating base is 1,300 miles or a few days' journey away. Soon after the processing, the products must be unloaded from the base in order to deliver them to the coast and then to the regions. 
берег и дальше отправлять уже в регионы. Dobrofloat has three ice-class vessels built in Greece for the project Possier. Reefer ships of the project Possier ships are unique in their own way. They can pass along the Northern Sea route even without the help of icebreakers, which in August 2015 was brilliantly proved by Captain Vladimir Slizov. These are quite unique vessels. They are multi-purpose. Almost anything can be transported on these ships, from cars, 20-pound containers to frozen fish, vegetables, fruit. Mr. Vladimir Petrovich is considered one of the most efficient captains. At a rate of seven trips a year, he manages to make it up to 12, despite the weather and the risks associated with it. Yet, sailors do not even like the word risk. No one risks at sea. These are usual things, of course, with adjustments to the weather, with adjustments to some other factors, technical capabilities of the vessel. Of course, this is a hard job, and it looks like an extreme situation to those who are on the ground. But in fact, it looks quite different from the bridge. Garmonia has three holds with three levels each, and in each of the nine cargo tanks, it is possible to maintain individual temperature settings up to minus 28 degrees. It can carry 3,000 tons of cargo in total. It seems that there is even more on the dock. That's just how chaotic this box looks, stuffed with packing materials, bales of spices and various machines, whose purpose is hard to understand for non-pros. All of this is carried on board from the shore, under the crew's supervision. Caution, caution, and once again caution, because a ship is pretty well a dangerous means of transport. And here's the main thing, of course, is security. Compliance with security requirements in all aspects. Not every ship owner can afford to have teams of loaders in every port. So, judging by the autographs in the hold, people of different nations worked on Garmonia. The ship can take up to half a thousand tons per day. So, you can handle the loading in 48 hours. But Garmonia has been standing for a long time, and there seems to be no end to the cargo. This time, the holds will be filled with a little more than the half. And to improve the seaworthiness, it will have to take ballast. This task is solved by the chief mechanic. And plus 121, plus 123. Here, we need 860 tons of ballast. Garmonia can move at a speed of more than 15 knots, and there will be enough fuel reserves even for a round-the-world cruise. Even now, there is enough fuel to cross the Sea of Okhotsk twice, but it's necessary to foresee an increase in fuel usage when the ship is returning with 300 tons of production. That immediately increases the load on the ship's power plant. That is, there is one compressor working, and if the products are poorly frozen, you have to use two compressors. These are additional and quite powerful electricity consumers. Plus, there are mechanisms that support the refreshment. Finally, the loading is finished. The hydraulic lines have been installed where the cargo doors are, and almost in total darkness, a tanker approaches Gardemonia. But now, of all times, the refueling hose is too short and can't reach the receiver. Stretch one of the ends to the stern. Well, in short, we need more people to the stern and the tank. It took the efforts of two crane operators and both deck crews so that the process of fueling finally began. As a result, pumping of 200 tons of mazout and 50 tons of so-called light diesel fuel is delayed until the morning, instead of the usual four to five hours. It seemed it was all. The ship can go. But the captain still has long negotiations ahead with the authorities, border control and customs. 
No, the ship isn't going to foreign ports, and the Sea of Okhotsk is considered internal. But a law is a law. So, armed with a bundle of documents as thick as a complete collection of Pushkin's works, Mr. Vladimir Petrovich is preparing to welcome the inspectors on board and lose a few more hours. Finally, when twilight is already gathering over Nakhotka, there is a long-awaited phrase heard on the bridge. The ship is ready, passing control to the bridge. Good. Attention, mooring teams, stand by for unmooring. Stop, unmoor. With the help of tugs, Garmonia leaves the Bay of Nakhotka. La Paru Strait and Sakhalin are remaining behind, and ahead there is the turbulent Sea of Okhotsk. Garmonia isn't actually afraid of a storm, but the captain must think not only about the dangers threatening the ship and the crew. In stormy weather, as a rule, there is significant flooding of the vessel, the hold covers. There is danger of the damage to the cargo, respectively. To avoid this, the ship slows down, although fuel consumption does not significantly decrease with such maneuvers. Once again, considering the meteorological report and his own experience, Captain Slizov decides not to go directly to the floating base, but to make the route closer to the shore. In this case, there is a chance to encounter areas of small ice pieces. But Garbonia isn't afraid of ice. But such a maneuver will possibly help to bypass areas with stormy weather, so that the speed will be much higher and the cargo will be much safer. A 100-meter vessel is difficult to call small or compact. Nevertheless, you can't walk along it. Even seasoned sailors go out onto the deck only in helmets and, in addition to that, fasten themselves with carabiners to the lifelines to be reassured. The broadside is relatively low, so such precautions can't be considered superfluous. Such an expeditionary way of natural resource development was invented more than a century ago, and mainly for hunting and processing of whales. Whales were hunted in the polar latitudes far from the ports where it would be possible to do the processing. In the middle of the last century, huge flotillas numbering dozens of vessels sailed across the oceans. The Soviet fishing fleet was the most productive in the world. At the peak, fishermen extracted up to 11 million tons of fish and seafood a year. The peculiarity of Russian geography, especially its eastern, far eastern part, is that most of the coast is not populated. We almost lost the opportunity to process fish products on the coast. Most of the fish processing villages were founded regardless of the economic expediency and in Soviet times actually existed at public expense. Now life in them comes back with salmon fishing seasons. In the current situation, we took the same approach as the Soviet Union once took. The Soviet Union, despite the resources that were allocated to the development of the Far East, still focused on the construction of floating processing plants.
A huge factory ship with a height of a 15-floor building processes up to 600 tons of fish every day in the sea. Sevalod Sibirtsev went on the next expedition a few months ago, has already passed thousands of nautical miles, and now works in the north of the Sea of Okhotsk. Several trawlers supply the floating base with raw materials, and communication with the coast is made possible with the help of reefer ships. Built in the Finnish shipyards for the Soviet fishing fleet, the world's largest floating factory was almost scrapped. But it was returned to Russia, and now this giant claimed to be the flagship of the country's fishing industry. Sievahotsk, fishing area 51, the giant floating factory of Sevalod Sibirtsev is in anticipation of the reefer ship Garmonia, which left Nahotka and is carrying supplies. It will take the finished products from the floating base. Well, in any case, we always carry supplies, like some materials, transport passengers, for example, who have their contracts ended, who resigned because of an illness. In other words, in the direction of the floating base, the ships always go loaded with supplies. Now it's just the time to develop a plan to produce frozen fish and canned food and distribute the cargo through the holds. Yuri Arshinin, the production manager, is in charge of it. Logisticians work here. They get daily reports and see the space available on board so that we won't be stuffed with four tons and 68,000 boxes of cans. And then we will have to look for some room to put more. The captain of the floating base Valery Voloshin is a hereditary sailor. A reefer ship was even named after his father the son of a man and a ship named after Captain Volochin. He became a captain in 1985, but started at the end of the 70s on the whaling fleet. He doesn't think that his work is either simple or routine. There is a task plan. The company and the captain director have certain limits in each area. Well, this is the so-called Area 51. As soon as we reach the limits, we'll move on to another area. It is not easy to control such a floating base. Due to its huge size, the ship has large windage. At sea, the wind can reach the speed of 50 meters per second. In such conditions, the floating base must literally balance so as not to fall into the angle of list of more than two degrees. In order to comply with all these parameters, we have a strong ballast system. Yeah, 200 tons in, five tanks from each side. We are adjusting the angle of list. Mechanics are important for any ship, especially for a floating base with such a production complex. All mechanics on the ship are supervised by the chief mechanic, Igor Chek. Bearing the same name as a famous goalkeeper, he's been at sea since 1984. Sitting in the CCR, central control room of the power system, he's thinking about what won't cross the mind of an outsider, the importance of fresh water. There is a water distiller whose technical capacity is 455 tons a day. To produce even that amount of water, you need to spend 7 tons of fuel a day. So the water becomes too expensive. A more modern and economical technology is implemented in a new generation desalination plant, which looks somewhat strange compared to the rest of the equipment. 
This device is built on the principle of so-called reverse osmosis. Its essence is the use of a special water permeable membrane, which holds sea salt back. The liquid that has passed through such a barrier is suitable for drinking. You only have to move it to the water supply system. And the sea salt concentrate, the so-called reject water, is just drained overboard. The power system of the Vsevolod Sibirtsev can be studied as in a visual aid right here, in the engine room. First, it's almost unnaturally clean here. And second, it's even simpler than a construction set for children. On the ship, there are two eight-cylinder engines with a capacity of 4,400 horsepower each. The combining gearbox ensures their operation simultaneously in pairs or separately, depending on what's needed. The shaft follows the gearbox, and the torque is transmitted to the propeller. Well, and perhaps most importantly, this is the fluid actuated clutch that allows you to switch the torque between the propeller shaft and the secondary electric generator. This is very helpful when you have to go at a very low speed of, say, one to two knots. The thing is that such medium-speed diesel-fueled engines don't work well without load. In a working day of the floating base, they need up to 40 tons of fuel, apart from other operating supplies. Moreover, even if the huge vessel is just drifting, fuel consumption is not reduced drastically because the main engines are not the main consumers of fuel. Basically, the fuel goes here. It is the refrigerator, the freezing complex. This is a huge load. This is the ship's course. Why? Because the floating base, in principle, is a structure that should stand. It's not for sailing somewhere. On each of such trays, there are 20 kilograms of fresh fish, which in minus 50 degrees in two and a half hours becomes fresh frozen. This is one of the three freezing complexes located on board of Sevalod Sibirtsev. And altogether, they raise energy consumption to a level of three megawatts. This is comparable to the capacity of the first nuclear power units. The world's first Obninsk nuclear power plant produced up to 5 megawatts of electricity. Zevelod Sibirtsev manages it with only three diesel generators. The main thing is to have something to process. The factory ship can process up to 650 tons of fish per day, but the usual rate is about 500 tons, or, in terms of the Pacific herring, one and a half million individuals. If you imagine that along the entire perimeter of this huge vessel, fishermen are standing with fishing rods with an interval of one meter, then in order to provide the floating factory with raw materials, each of them will have to pull out three fish every minute. And this is is without a break for holidays, weekends, sleep and lunch. A very busy schedule. Self-sustained extraction of raw materials, however, is possible. For example, it is possible to set traps on the world-famous king crab with the help of motorboats, which still haven't been used on the fishing deck. Well, fish are caught by special fishing vessels, which are part of the expedition. One of them is the trawler seiner Kalinovka, led by Sergei Bova, a young 38-year-old captain. He took command of this ship recently. Before that, he had sailed on trawlers of the Project 420. They are 10 meters shorter. I'm here after the 420. One can say it's a cruiser compared to the Project 420. In addition to commanding the crew, searching for fish and delivering the catch to the shipping base, the captain also observes what is happening in the mining area. There is special equipment that figures out who competitors are what they say about fishing. And when analyzing your ships and theirs, you are already making a decision where it's better to sail. 
where it is better to place the trawl. The information from the locators helps the captain. The sonar system has been installed for a year already. It is very effective in terms of searching for objects, such as salary, herring. Right now it is clearly visible. There is a shoal of herring in our course, and we're trying to pursue the shoal on it. The obtained information determines not only the movement of small fishing vessels, even the huge floating base moves after the fish, all in order to speed up the delivery of fresh raw materials to the production and optimize the fuel consumption of the trawlers. We follow after the trawlers. All this is coordinated. We have communication between captains, roll calls. Well, in order to understand where every ship is, when the trawl started fishing, when it will choose the course, which catch they will get, and for what period of time, how much it has trawled. So everything in general is well organized. Meanwhile, the ship Gardamonia, which left Nahotka four days ago, has a few miles to cover to deliver supplies and pick up fish and canned food from Sevalodzibirtsu. According to the power to weight transport ratio, Gardamonia will easily handicap a huge floating plant. A two cycle diesel engine with a capacity of a 7,750 horsepower allows Gardamonia to go at more than 16 knots. And this is not the maximum, rather the so-called economical full stroke. The mechanical part of Gardamonia is under the supervision of Alexander Vadimovich Omelchenko, an experienced chief mechanic who spent more than 40 years at sea. The chief mechanic keeps the situation under control, even if there is no one at the helm. This isn't uncommon for modern ships. This is the autopilot's job. That is, the course is set. The gyro compass shows to the north. Our courses say the north zero. Our courses say 135 degrees. So, due to the interconnection of the gyro compass system, the tracking system, the vessel returns to its course if there is any deviation. The refrigerator installation is also the chief mechanic's responsibility. If he fails, the efforts of trawlers and processors will literally melt down. While there is no refrigerated cargo on board, the refrigerators are turned off and the refrigerator mechanics have an opportunity to carry out maintenance work that needs to be completed before approaching the floating base. After we begin to load the cargo, the refrigerator system is activated, and now it should work until the end of the full unloading. Therefore, they have a small amount of time. But trawler saners have none. Even if refrigerators were installed in the original project, they were dismantled to improve the cargo capacity. So, immediately after lifting of trawls, fishing vessels rush to stand under the right side of the floating base for unloading. One such grid, it is also called a braille net, holds about three tons of fish. A trawler brings to the board of the shipping base from 60 to over 100 tons at a time, which means that the crane operator will have to do a seemingly incredible trick at least 20 times. First, attach the braille net to the trawler's side, and then aim to unload onto the grate of the receiving hopper. And this is done regardless of the wind and waves. Actually, when you look at the way the tops of the trawler's masts move in all kinds of trajectories in the air, it just seems incredible that they have even managed to moor it.
and Garmonia is hurrying to moor to the port side. In addition to packing material and food, there is another important resource on board, without which the work of the floating base is impossible. And that is factory workers. Sevelod Sibirtsev already appeared on the radar of Garmonia. Now, instead of some pleasant activities, Captain Slizov and Valoshin will have to moor in the open sea. Mooring in the sea is different from mooring on the coast. There are no marine pilots, no tugs, which ensure the mooring. And, of course, every mooring is more like an art of the captains, who are on the bridges of these two vessels. In the meantime, the second assistant, Sergei Krivolopov, is busy negotiating the procedure for overloading the supply. Sergei Ivanovich, tell me what is your third, exactly on top? What kind of containers? Over. So, on top I have, so I have number seven. This is for herring, right? It is in the second room. In the third, I have shell and box. The weather, speaking the seaman language, is freshening every minute. And so, the captains aren't going to have a calm mooring. And the reload must be quick. However, the constructive feature of the ship can help here. The hatches on Garmonia are wide enough, if necessary, for a 20-foot container. Naturally, this allows to speed up the loading process of this vessel in the sea, increase productivity. The vessel can take or unload a cargo of up to 1,500 tons per day with the correct organization of work. For other types of vessels, as a rule, these figures are limited to 400 to 600 tons, not more. While the teams of Garmonia and Sibirtsev are getting ready for mooring in the open sea, this moment is stressful for both captains and the crew. Course, 28. Ease to 24. Ease to 24. Slow astern. Slow astern. Stop engine. Stop engine. Halfway to the starboard. Halfway to the starboard. Forward. Forward. Midships. Midships. Stop engine. Stop engine. Those on Garmonia's tank. Let's do it. Great. Good job, everybody. That's it. Less than an hour has passed since the appearance of the floating base in sight to the well-deserved praise from the captain. Now it's time to give the supply and take the finished products. Time is precious. The wind is getting stronger. There is a feeling of a coming storm in the air. In the holds of the floating base, work is going on. On a steel platform, there are three tons of frozen fish, and all of this flies in a few centimeters from the head of a hold sailor. How he manages to remain calm, only the sea god knows. We know who is operating the crane, got used to him, how he works. And the crane is operated by Roman. He got on Sevelod Sibirtsev right after school, and at the age of 19, he became a crane operator. The factory ship has had several owners over the years, but for Roman, nothing has changed. He is still dedicated to his work. Well, all jobs here are equally hard, full of responsibility, because it's not a joke. Large loads, expensive products. We must be attentive, watch everywhere. Focusing on the gestures of the signalman, Roman with short finger movements causes the products to fly from side to side. And in addition, he answers my questions with the same short phrases. Any slightest inaccuracy and there will be victims. That's all you think about, only about this. 
Well, how to say, you gain experience over the years. You watch where the pendant is, what angle the swell has, where, what to catch. And you move and catch. Unlike Roman, his crane has worked in the USSR when a red flag with a sickle and hammer was swinging on the flagpoles of 253 factory ships. And there were also 33 projects of larger factory ships, which most of the time had interconnected professions, making canned and frozen food right in the sea. In total, there were 1,319 of such vessels. In addition, the Ministry of Fisheries held a fleet of 42 surface scientific vessels and two dozen submarines. And here you ask yourself a question, where did all of this go? But the answer is painfully obvious. It all collapsed together with the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The thing is that the Soviet fishing industry was planned unprofitable, a situation absolutely unthinkable during the current market realities. Today, unprofitability would immediately put an end to the company's business. But still, here it is, a huge floating island in the middle of the Sea of Okhotsk, whose inhabitants, living in a hostile environment, extract and process natural resources. This is how a part of Soviet reality has reached our time, which is unlikely to be reproduced in the foreseeable future. I doubt that this is possible in the next, say, five to seven, maybe ten years. Because the economic situation doesn't allow us to recoup such a large-scale shipbuilding. Today, ships, which are two, two and a half or three times smaller, are more popular. They can make profits according to the investment without long payback periods. However, Captains Voloshin, Slizov and Bova certainly don't care about economics right now. There is a cyclone coming in the Sea of Okhotsk. The storm begins. The wind increases to 30 meters per second, and the waves grow to several meters. This is a threat of icing up not only for small vessels like trawlers, but also 100-meter ships. What was just a simple routine recently becomes deadly dangerous. The work has to be stopped. The ships are sent to the nearest storm shelter, the Shelting Bay, near Magadan. <laughs> 